Welcome back. We are in a very windy Stratford-upon-Avon and we're parked up next to the canal side. Absolutely beautiful. Let's go discover a bit of Shakespeare country. We left Bristol and travelled up sort of north through the Cotswolds, stopped at a couple of laybys and service stations and that kind of thing. So let's go see what Billy Shakespeare is all about, shall we? So Stratford-upon-Avon is located in the West Midlands. It's a historic market town, is that what they call it? I think so. <laughs> Travellers that are not very good with geography. <laughs> I think it's a historic market town. It's medieval anyway, so hopefully we're going to see kind of lots of medieval buildings and just find out who William Shakespeare was. We've both got our own opinions, haven't we? Yeah, on yeah. our little William yeah. Shakespeare. Yeah, differ. Differ, so we'll tell you about those <laughs> in a bit. I studied um, William Shakespeare at school, which I'm sure most people in the UK have done. Um, I don't know about abroad, I don't know if they study William Shakespeare abroad, but definitely in the UK, it were always on the syllabus in my era anyway. Um, and I were always really, really, really rubbish at like reading, writing, hated reading out in class. I always used to get really upset and embarrassed about it. Turned out I were dyslexic, but back in the day, they used to say, oh, it's all right, she'll grow out of it. Um, and when I read William Shakespeare, it was like opening up a whole new world to me. So I've never really been somebody that can read even now and get anything from it. I've done a degree, I've done a master's degree, but I can't read and get anything from a story in terms of what's in my imagination, how I feel, anything like that. And so reading about William Shakespeare at school, it opened up that whole new world for me. It was something where because you're working your way through the language and you're figuring it out, it actually created an image in my head. I actually got something from it. I could see the play as if it were actually happening. And everybody else says they get that from reading stories and I do. I can only read factual books. That's the only thing that I, I actually kind of enjoy. William Shakespeare introduced me to literature and I actually really enjoyed it and I've seen so many of his plays performed as well and really enjoyed every one of them. I've seen some of them three and four times over and I just think he's a master, or was a master at language, an absolute master at being able to use the language of the time and conjure up images and conjure up feelings and emotions um, although some of his content these days is a bit questionable. <laughs> I've read that people kind of say is the greatest writer of all time and that's why I have a bit of a problem. I think he's the greatest writer of his time but the greatest writer of all time. Now this is from somebody who absolutely loves books. I love the imagination that books bring. I love the world that books bring. And so is, you know, reading Macbeth better than reading Philip Pullman's Northern Lights? I'd say not really. Um, but was he the greatest writer for his time? Absolutely. We're just wondering what this statue is there. There's a statue of a guy sat on top of, um, on top of this little thing here with other statues. So I'm thinking that that's probably William Shakespeare on top of that. And then all of the other writers are beneath him. Look. So we got it right. It is actually Shakespeare at the top. <laughs> this statue actually is of um, William Shakespeare. It was built in 1888 by a guy called Lord Ronald Gower. Um, and it took him over 10 years to build it. He actually used his own money to put it together. And it was originally built um, in front of the uh, theatre and Shakespeare was facing Holy Trinity Church, but then the theatre was destroyed by a fire. And so in 1926, it was moved to where it is now. And it's got four figurines surrounding. So you've got um, Shakespeare right on the top, and then you've got Hamlet, Lady Macbeth, Falstaff and Prince Hal, which are all the way around. And then it's got these kind of bronze masks, um, which each have flowers. You've got poppies, you've got peonies, they're representing tragedy. Um, you've got comedy, um, which is represented by hops and roses. And so it's all the way around, you've got these different kind of masks. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. So you see, that quote is what I like about William Shakespeare, because it's, you've got to break it down you don't just read it and conjure up some image in your in your imagination you've got to really sort of break down what he's saying and Shakespeare used a lot of metaphors in his writing so when he's talking about the um, shadow what he's talking about is like the, the the passing of life like how it just kind of 
quickly disappears and you know and then he's, when he's talking about the actor basically being on stage and performing he's talking about the fact that it's what his character that he's playing is not really real so when you put that together and you look at you know life in general that kind of means that you know life is so quick and these characters that we play these things that we pretend to be in oh. life in order to achieve things is really just like it's all pretense is what he's saying. Life passes you by so quickly, so don't pretend to be something that you're not. Be true to yourself. I do think though that sometimes you can break down things in stories too much. Like, you know, yeah. because when you're studying them at school and stuff like that, and you're made to break every single part of it down, it is open for interpretation what it means. You don't actually know whether that person sat down and really thought about that sentence to that degree. Or whether he just wrote a story for his time. I had to study Macbeth at school for the short amount of time um, that I had to en endure the, my miserable existence there. But, um, <laughs> but it were, uh, I didn't stay very long, I'll tell you that story another time. Reading Shakespeare again now, just for a story, I might, I might enjoy it. I might look at it differently. Yeah, I you might. I do think that there's an element of where you can sort of destroy something by breaking it down too much, but also you do have to see like the the wisdom in and and the creativity in in the language as well. We're just laughing because <laughs> I can't stop saying it absolutely and definitely. <laughs> Somebody pointed it out the other day on comments. Um, they that, said that they've played, they sit at home and they play definitely and absolutely bingo when they're watching us. It's like, it's so much epic. I always say it's absolutely epic or definitely and when I agree with Emma. And now we've got to the point where I'm pulling him up every time he says it. I can't help it. I can't help it. It's like this place here. Look at this. This is absolutely epic. Because it is. We used to say so a lot, didn't we? So, and, um, and we've got better at that. Yeah, we've got a bit better at that, I think. And now it's absolutely everything. Try filming yourselves, though, and see how often you say certain words, because you don't realise how often you use certain words. This is, though, absolutely epic. It's absolutely epic. <laughs> Wait till you see this. Gorgeous. You see, look at that. They didn't worry back then, did they, whether an house were leaning or bulging or whatever. That'd get condemned for subsidence these days. <laughs> you see, that's what I mean. That's not just epic, is it? I can't say, oh, that's epic. It's absolutely epic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got to laugh, haven't you? I think it's only in a place like this where you can come and there's a man in a bowler hat that has to ask the jewellers to unlock the door before you can actually go in. I mean, that is just unbelievable, isn't it? Talk about not fitting in. <laughs> yeah, I swear, look, <laughs> I'm not joking you. It's nearly 13 grand for a watch. Yeah. I'm not kidding Give you. Over for a I watch. just had a look, I thought it's got to be expensive because it's got like a menacing man in a bowler hat stood on the door with door locked. I'm not kidding you, right? Look at this one, £25,000 for a watch. Twenty-five grand for a watch, that's more than our van. <laughs> it doesn't even look, I'm not being funny, right, but it looks like you could buy that on the market. It's not even that nice. Literally. That's insane. That's a lot of money <gasps> to tell time, isn't it? <laughs> look at this one, Reese. Look at this one, £42,000. No way, that's a house. No, seriously, do people really spend that sort of money? To tell the time. I don't, do you reckon to tell viewers spend that sort of money? No, let us know, let us know I'm in the really comments. I'm really sorry if I've offended anybody, but I just cannot. I know it's a Rolex and I get the importance behind apparently the name, but to me, that is just a name of somebody that made a watch in it, right? I'm sure there are other watchmakers out there that make just as good, if not better watches, and you don't have to spend 42 grand on them. 42 grand? Let us know in the comments what you think of that. Have you got a watch like that? I don't even wear a watch, but it's just to tell the time, isn't it? Surely. Oh, 42,000? Are we missing summer here? <laughs> Why would he spend 42? You can literally buy a house, can't you, for 42,000? I genuinely did not know the cost that much. I genuinely did not know that what the cost. I know people can pay like 10 grand, but God. There's a jumper there for 285 quid though, so swings, you know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sorry if we're offended anybody. Somebody sat there watching this with a £285 jumper on and a Rolex watch going, <laughs> Reese, what are you doing? Emma, shut up. 
How rude of us. We haven't even introduced ourselves if you're new here. We are Emma Reese and our little dog Daisy and we travel all around the UK and Europe in our camper van called Romany exploring the best that this country and beyond has to offer. And we have a canal boat. Oh yeah, and we have a canal <laughs> boat as well. I said, tell me your story. It's a little dog just for you. Look, it's a little dog. <laughs> How cute is that? Oh my God, that is actually a tiny house. <laughs> this might fit my sister. She's about <laughs> that tall. <laughs> oh, that's this. <laughs> So yet again, I have lost Emma. You can probably it's hear her actually on the microphone because her mic will be switched on. We've lost um, him, we? Where has she gone? She's just disappeared. Ready? I was getting that shot Ooh. up there. Of that. Oh, she's there. Out we come. Wondered where you'd gone. <laughs> thought, oh, she'll be in there and then you won't. And I started to panic. I thought I was going to get lost forever. <laughs> I thought I was never ever going to be found. I get lost really easily. You've got to keep an eye on me, otherwise I'll just wander off and then I don't know where I am. Look at this charity shop, this looks really cool. <coughs> this behind me is believed to be the birthplace of William Shakespeare, born in 1564. It's a half timber house frame. It's not architecturally like outstanding really, but it would have been considered quite grand for its time. Um, William's dad was actually a glove maker um, and a wool dealer, so he must have had some kind of money to be able to build something like this. It's situated on Henley Street in Stratford-upon-Avon's town centre, and it's believed that he actually, Shakespeare actually spent his childhood years here as well as being born here. It's now a museum that you can go in and visit, but it ain't cheap to get in. Right next door to it is a Shakespeare bookshop. The buildings are all Tudor and there's old fashioned sweet shops. It gave us a real sense and feel of what England would have looked like in Shakespeare's time. Then he kept walking on, down the road. on these streets you get a real feel of kind of medieval, oldie England. Um, it's really cool and you can kind of see Shakespeare's influence. Use your imagination when you're here, you can almost hear the old horse and carts going through these little um, alleyways. Oh, it's got a very feel of kind of Chesterfield sofas, cigars and whiskey, almost prestigious, uh, upper class, very kind of feel to it. But you can feel the literature, you can feel the writing, I can't explain it, it's really weird. Feeling of, uh, of Shakespeare's time, I guess. Oh, Reese, look at this. This is just amazing. Look at that fireplace. This is just absolutely gorgeous. You can see inside it's empty. Wow, that's got amazing. A beautiful isn't it? fireplace, a really big old fireplace. The ceilings are really low as well. It's like, if you think about if that fireplace could tell a story. Like all the things it's seen, all the people it's seen. It's, ah. Oh. Love history, like being able to look into old buildings and stuff like that, it's amazing. It's called the Shakespeare Hostel. So we've seen where Shakespeare were born. We're gonna now try and see uh, his, his uh, memorial, uh, if we can. So we're gonna go check that out now. Uh, this, this place is just incredible. I didn't say absolutely then, I did well. <laughs> I'm getting better. It's, it's so nice as well to have come from like the busy cities and stuff like that and you know just to come into something where it's just such a contrast. Got I'll... a much more chilled out feel to yeah, it. Yeah, it? yeah. We've 
seen some amazing Tudor buildings over the years, haven't we, of different places that we've been to, but I've never seen so many in one place. It's, it really is like stepping back in time because it's not just where they're scattered amongst more modern buildings, which can look interesting, but it's literally like you're stepping back in time. This is also like a photographer or filmmaker's paradise. It really is like if you're into your photography or your cinematography or anything like that, this is just brilliant. And you can you can follow like the Shakespeare story throughout the town and kind of get guided tours if you want um, and things like that. But trying to capture this and it's golden hour as well is epic. This is Shakespeare's schoolroom, King Edward the sixth i think still used for teaching until 11 a.m every day so this is actually where william shakespeare were a pupil in 15 in the 1570s um, and he actually sat in the classroom that still exists today and learnt in that classroom and it's where he would have watched his first ever play with the famous people of the time performing oh, so this is where he would have got all his inspiration from this is where he would have been this is the place taught yeah and they're still teaching here after all this time is absolutely amazing, but you can have a tour around and sort of step back in time to actually see the, the actual desk where they would have sat. It's dubbed the most atmospheric building in the whole of Britain is this. Because of Daisy, bless her little heart, there's lots we can't actually go in and see, unfortunately, <laughs> which is, is a real shame. But Daisy! You just spoil everything, Daisy, <laughs> don't you? Look at this, look at the... Every building is just... Look at these, look at these trees, am I, going up the building? Look at that! Look at that! And they've all got, like, coat of arms over them as well. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Daisy's barking again because she's seen another dog. But every single building, you cannot turn a corner here without seeing history just staring yeah. you straight in the face. It's literally around every single corner. You don't come here, do you, and it's just like one street? No, it's and it's over. inspiring. It's really inspiring. I was just saying, I never knew that they had um, the high school. Um, so they built like a modern high school right behind the school where Shakespeare went and they still take the students, as I say, into that classroom to be able to learn. I mean, can you imagine doing that, learning in the same classroom, possibly the same seat where William Shakespeare was? It, there's nothing more inspirational for life, is there? I don't think you could get anything that would be more inspiring than, and full of culture than that. But it's, you know, you've got, it, everywhere you go just feels very inspiring and cultural, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. You want to pick up a pen and write. <laughs> yeah, or a quill. <laughs> Look at these tree branches here. <gasps> wow. Look at that. That's what I want in our cottage inside the living room, look. That's what I keep going on about. Yeah, it's all just winding up the house. I wonder if anybody knows if there's somebody that sells, like, trees like that that you know because I want I want something like that in the in the cottage in the living room to make it like really fairy you know but you can't buy them so you see this is exactly as point that house with all the roots outside of it we're just walking past and there's literally a plaque about it and it's the oldest house in the town so this is called the dower house um, and it was basically um, was built in 14 dates back to 1450 um, it was extended in 1590 and by 1600 it was the home of Thomas Reynolds um, and Thomas Reynolds' son, William, was actually remembered in William Shakespeare's uh, will. This is actually the oldest part of the house and I've just come round the corner to have a look at it and it's got like a secret garden. Oh, it's just... Oh. So that corner bit there is actually the oldest part, the original part of the house that dates back to 1400s. Astonishing. I took out an old pen I wrote in my story Then I kept walking on down the road I pray he reads 
I view life as like a kind of collective of moments. You know, you have those moments like we do when we're travelling where you might meet somebody and you don't know what the name is and you're probably never going to see them again. But it's just those little moments that are really important even though, you, you know, you may never form a friendship with that person. And I think that a lot of people view life as in like the biggest thing that they've achieved in their life or something like that. And I do, I view life as like a collective of all those little moments, all those little things that have happened in that person's life. And when you come into like a, a place like this and you see all the headstones and you're reading about what's gone on in their life, it, you, you're only getting a snapshot of the things like, you know, maybe how many children they've had, how long they lived, um, you know, whether they had, you know, brothers, sisters, that type of thing. But you're able to kind of get just that little glimpse into the normal average person's life years ago. And I think that's just, a, I don't know, I just find that really intriguing, really, really intriguing. I think memorial stones as well are something we're eventually going to lose, aren't we? The more people are cremated, the more we're going to lose this kind of mark of a person being here, I guess. You know, what were, what were this person's story? What were that person's story? What were your story, mate? Everybody has a story and it's so important that we remember people's stories and the time on earth, you know. So William Shakespeare died on the 23rd of April 1616 at age 52 years old and this was his final resting place in this beautiful building overlooking these beautiful surroundings. It's not a bad final resting place, is it? So that, that were really kind of, it's shifted my view as that, like of what I originally said of Shakespeare, coming here and feeling it, that's the thing, feeling how, how this guy created all these stories and plays and his writing and being able to come here and picture him writing at his desk and seeing the school he went to and, you know, his birthplace, his final resting place has kind of put it into perspective a little bit for me and changed my viewpoint. And to be fair, coming here and feeling it, I must admit, it probably is the greatest writer of all time. So that was William Shakespeare's story. Keep writing your own story, guys. See you next week, 8pm on Tuesday. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and the notification bell. <laughs>